Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to a new series that we're going to be starting here on all four of our channels and a few other people as we incorporate other people. This is going to be a type of news podcast for gaming. Today we're mostly going to be talking about Hearts of Iron 4 and we're going to be leading off our discussion with one mod that we all find particularly interesting or have really just enjoyed using. So let's start off here with Dave. What mod do you find I... interesting? Hello, hello, I'm Dave Feedback Gaming. My YouTube channel is Dave Feedback Gaming. And oh okay, so Where's I'll start off with yeah. my <laughs> I'll start off with my favorite mod. My favorite mod is I'm gonna go with one that's actually kind of a small one. It's only a small interface mod, but it's the one that's helped me out the most, and that is the better terrain view. Uh, it's super simple. All it really does is it gives you a simple terrain view to make you show the whole everything's a lot more visible and it's easy to see you know, like if you're gonna get an advantage or disadvantage in attacking. I don't know, I really loved it. It made my game a a huge, a lot of big, big difference, and uh, yeah, no, I really love that one. All right, Seth. Uh, well, need need I say any more? Uh, of course, it's going to be Millennium Dawn, considering that <laughs> that's all I really work on as far as modding is concerned. Um, yeah, I, I mean, most of you, everyone has probably seen it already, but of course, bringing Hearts of Iron Four to the modern day, it is a. Uh, there's there's been some challenges here and there, but I, I can I can tell it's it's gonna go places. The only the only place you can go up, and we're gonna go all the way up. All right, Alex. Well, I don't do that many mods. I've recently started playing a Scandinavian mod because somebody wanted me to do World Conquest with Norway and Sweden and, and all that. So I said, okay, we'll do Scandinavia then. But um, I usually do just some cosmetic mods, and my favorite one, I think, is the NATO, more NATO counters mod. So I can get all my, all my little counter needs met, because I hate sprites. <laughs> I think we, I think a lot of people do. Yeah, I... I Boo. Uh, Boo. Yeah, just sprites. They can be a little For difficult. For children. Um, my favorite mod that I found particularly interesting is the Military Rations and Provisions mod. I'm from the Awkward Guy, by the way. It essentially adds another thing that you can produce within your military industry of military rations, basically. It, all, it makes you need to actually give food to your soldiers. I know. I was shocked, too. I didn't know people needed food to eat or food to live, so... Um, but yeah, I found that particularly interesting because it just adds a whole new dynamic where you actually have to worry about feeding your soldiers rather than just arming them. And I What's think that, that would be again? Um, military rations and provisions. I'll, I'll leave a link oh. to it in the description. Yeah, well, you should say, probably you, leave I links say, you to all these. Probably should leave a link. I say yeah, that. we'll have links in the description because they're definitely these are all mods that really do improve the game. Now, the next topic that we're going to go on to is, and I'm sure a lot of people have some strong opinions on this, is AI. So, as I'm sure anybody who's played this game knows that the AI, oh, the AI, they are not the smartest. They try. Sometimes they try. But they can be a little annoying sometimes. And I think right now we're going to discuss a few ways that the AI can be annoying and can be just a huge hindrance and what we think they would need to do to improve it. So, if anybody would like to lead this off here. <laughs> what, is, what does AI stand for again? Artificial <laughs> intelligence. Wait. Uh, is, does that have anything I, I... to do with what's going on in Hearts of Iron? Right. <laughs> uh, the AI is woefully inadequate. Is how? that a... Yeah. Uh, I think the main problem with the AI about... it, is it has no idea how to prioritize fronts yes. properly. Has no concept of yeah. supply. Mm. It does not understand supply. Yeah, the friendly AI is is not only stupid but annoyingly stupid. Well, yeah, I was just <laughs> recording um, another episode of my India series, and I had my AI sending twenty, thirty divisions into an area where I barely had supply for my own troops, and it stopped mm -hmm. my entire offensive because I did not have supply, and the enemy started <laughs> no, pushing me yeah, back. Everybody's starving. <laughs> yeah. Like we had no, we had nothing, and it's. They they don't understand so many things, and I, I think I can't at one point I want to. The... Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just, one thing I was going to interject is I'd like to know kind of when you talk about AI, are you talking about specific AI as enemy opponents, or are you talking about specific AI as, as like kind of when you're making plans as such? You know, I like to all make the kind of division between the two. All of it, right? Okay. The, the, I mean, the general. Side, we're focusing on allies, but a general concept of AI. Yeah, what's it called? Is it called battle planning? What's it? What's there's actually a the proper name planning. for it, isn't it? I can't remember. Like 
Battle plan. Yeah. yeah, battle yeah, plan. Yeah, battle plans. Yeah, for the most part, I think battle plans for the most part are actually really, really, really damn good. I, oh, I, I love think them. That, that was the big. Yeah, in comparison to like, I mean, I started Hearts of Iron with Hearts of Iron too, and. It, it's. I, I jumped back into it. I got awesome democracy. I got it really cheap off Steam, and I was so gobsmacked at the fact that I have to move every individual unit by myself. I was like, yeah, "What is this? It's so hard." It is though. <laughs> oh, it's so and um, yeah. So sweet summer the, child. I mean, let's just talk about the gripes, though. The only. Gri- the only gripes that I can think of that the AI for battle planning is, is sometimes it just seems to throw too many divisions at a front line. I know that you could always just, you could always say, oh, well, that's the player's fault because you've designated too many troops on one specific front. But then sometimes it, it'll like it'll push, it'll create a supply bottleneck, and then it'll just sit on it forever and a day. You know, it doesn't even push. It's like, oh, bottleneck there, so we're not going to move. Like I told you to do offensive. I told you to attack. So then you've got to <laughs> manually move the troops in and. Yeah, and the AI doesn't, doesn't like that, though. Plan. They don't like that. They'll try to stop them from making their attack. They'll move them yeah. somewhere else. They hate that. They they will. They get a little yellow exclamation mark, which means that their <laughs> destination has no too low supply, so they don't want to move in there. Uh, can I just the interject yellow. something about the battle planner AI, if we're talking about that specifically? Now, I, I kind of jokingly say I like moving every single unit, but I actually mean that. I like that. But... I also appreciate that I don't have to move every single unit. I really wish there was this sort of toggle function where I could say, okay, don't move unless told to, or yeah. don't make an aggressive move right. unless told to. But the one thing that really annoys me about the battle plan is that I like making pockets, which every Hearts of Iron player does. So I want to pierce the enemy line in two points, and then I want to link up behind, and then I want to reduce the pocket. Mm-hmm. In Hearts of Iron 3, the way you would do that is you would pierce the line and then you would tell all your units to sort of pin down the enemy along the front. That would be a very normal thing to do. Just keep them pinned so you can move around and then create the pocket proper. Now, if I tell my the battle AI to move, it will move and advance and try to push the enemy back as quickly as possible. I don't want you to do that, but I want you to pin him. So I really wish there was this setting where you could tell the AI, try to stop the enemy from moving along the front, but don't capture ground. Mm. Yeah, you, you, well, you're forced the, to just send game... smaller amounts of divisions to do that. You have that option, you just yeah. can't send enough divisions to win, but then you sacrifice manpower, you sacrifice supplies. Yeah, that's not a good solution, is it? It's, the game kind of expects you to kind of create two armies and kind of make the pierce, don't they? I think to a certain degree, the, the, the game can't babysit for you. It kind of expects you to, to divide armies into divisions and try and make a specific pin. So, I mean, have you guys ever tried I, making I like, do three that, armies? I, yeah, I, oh, I do that. Oh. I, cre- I create like uh, an infantry army and then two panzer armies. And I did, Okay, let's say I have three infantry armies and two panzer armies. And I would pierce with the panzer armies, and the infantry armies are expected to hold the ground and pin the enemy. Mm-hmm. They just start I advancing, do- and as soon as the piercing, piercing starts, the AI will panic and start pulling back. Are you doing that thing where you create like... Uh, it, okay, this is a new issue, and maybe you guys have experienced this, that when you create a front, for instance, like, quote-unquote, pincer spearhead army, that when you make a narrow front, as it pushes, it makes the front bigger and bigger and bigger. And yes. you don't have to do that. You oh, and it sometimes <laughs> deletes your other front lines. And mm-hmm. it'll just delete your other front lines. And the, you have a whole 24 divisions just sitting way behind the line. It's like, what are you doing? Get up I there, really, man. Do do this? Like, I have this huge gap. Lines. Move over there. Yeah, just managing the front lines on on the eastern front and trying to keep our panzer armies together and infantry armies spread out and not lose their fronts and stuff. That is more challenging to wrestle with the user interface than it is to actually win Barbarossa. True. That's kind mm. of a problem. Mm. But don't you find it's it's almost just more effective just to create a huge front and push with a stronger, overwhelming force. Yes. It almost feels like the doctrine everyone seems to go for, not because they pick it, just because based on how they play it, is superior firepower. You know what I mean? Yes. The fact that everyone yes. creates a huge front and everyone just Just pushes. go with superior firepower, put a heavy, heavy tanks in every infantry division, lots of artillery, spread it out and advance, I don't know, Napoleonic style. Just advance on the broad front well, and just per- walk to Moscow. Personally, I just go for the mobile doctrine just because I try to fight the AI on it. I, I just try to fight them. I'm like, no, you will go here. So I go for the mobile doctrine just for the manpower at the end. I don't mean <laughs> the wheelchair, wheelchair rocket guys. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> it, it's a lot of manpower. If you're a small country, yes. that really yeah. makes a difference. I, I when I was playing as Macedonia in uh, Millennium Dawn, that's what I took. It can be extremely helpful. I wasn't referring to superior firepower as a specific doctrine, just kind of the overall play style because creating creating a vastly powerful army, right. aka right. lots of soft attack, lots of hard attack, big, really big, fat, high production divisions. It tends to be what everyone seems to do, regardless of what strategy to go for anyway. Just one thing I wanted to interject, just something that was in the dev diaries of the one of the power. I'm not sure if you guys, do any of you guys follow the dev diaries? Yeah, from time to time. Yeah, yeah. One of the ones that was mentioned, not in the recent one, the one before it, is they said that they have acknowledged the fact that the AI prioritizes new supplies to divisions that they're making, not existing ones. And that's kind of what happens when you invade Barbarossa. You do look at the strength of the enemy Soviet troops and you're like, hang on a minute, why are this half-strength division? It's because the AI has some kind of wonky thought process of prioritizing everything towards new divisions and leaving what they've already got. And, and to be honest with you, if, if they fix that, that is going to make Barbarossa incredibly tougher ignoring the fact that people are just going for this whole front thing just the fact that they're actually going to supply the divisions to 100 percent i call bullshit on it though um the reason why is i don't think the ai prioritizes building new divisions i think the ai doesn't change the default priorities at all which leaves new divisions on equal footing with reinforcing and um upgrading existing divisions I just. Really, I don't think the. Uh, yeah, I don't think the AI changes the priorities at all. I think they're, they're they're kind of it's kind of misleading to say well they're currently prioritizing building new divisions. I have. Nah, to agree. I don't think they do. I have to agree. I've seen the AI where they have no tanks, no infantry equipment, no artillery. I'm talking they're in the negatives by tens of thousands in artillery. Yet they're trying to build another forty, and I'm not even exaggerating here. Well, forty artillery brigades. They have no artillery and they're still trying to build here. that instead of focusing on industry. And this is this is from a modding perspective, is that every single everything in the game, all the units, everything has a literal in the text file a priority like number, and it literally determines, as far as I know, the order like the order of operations in which they will make the unit based on priority. And so what it is is that I imagine. However, whatever numbers they have used for building units, upgrading units, the supply which they send are probably incorrect. And as you see, a lot of the mods on the workshop that talk about AI rebalancing and such like that, what they're doing is they are changing the priority in the files to make it so that the AI does not make those decisions. So I, I don't know if it's necessarily BS, but... <laughs> Yes, it, it may not hold exactly what you guys are thinking of. Regardless of opinion, though, it's it specifically paradox. I've actually stated that in the dev diary. They actually state that there is a, an emphasis on prioritizing new divisions over existing ones, regardless of visually seeing the game. I guess there's one way of clearing it up, and maybe someone in the comments could clear this up, is has anyone actually mid-game decided to jump out of the save game and play as an AI? Has anyone actually done that? Sometimes, just to check. Like if it's on yeah, single player, just to I check what that. they're doing. Uh, One I, issue I've, I've seen, never, I'm never, I've done that, and I've never seen the AI set the 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 uh, reinforce, no. upgrade, and produce. I've never seen those three settings switched. That's not to say no. the AI needs to switch those in order to facilitate it doing that, but exactly. it definitely looks like it's unchanged. Yeah, but you're coming from a kind of a player perspective. The player doesn't kind of see the game as, as those specific buttons. Those buttons exactly. are very specifically designed for, for exactly. human play. So those buttons probably are null and void it when an AI is controlling anything. itself. It no, it doesn't. Anything. No, but I, I'm, I'm not going off hearsay or, or anecdotes. I'm literally saying what Paradox has said. Yeah, I think, I think Paradox is misrepresenting it a little bit. But if Paradox delivers on their promise to make the AI prioritize frontline units over building new ones then that will be great it'll be a whole uh, new game it honestly yes. would be that would change everything and that I would, would love probably to see that. bring the, the interesting thing though is if they improve uh -oh. the the actual enemy ai of this game mm -hmm. it's going to make the weaknesses of the um uh, of the battlefront um, battle planner uh, more apparent and it's going to make life harder for the um um, for the player in a player, fairly uncomfortable. Yeah. Did we lose Seth? Uh, nope. What? No, I'm right he's here. He's still with us. He's just being quiet. Okay. Yeah, I, I DC'd from him as well. I'm back now. Then. I yeah, I wasn't the one that's been lost. 
Is there anything uh, anything specific we can say that the AI is doing wrong at the moment that we can pinpoint as well? Other well than you guys what can hear me covered? fine, correct? correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I can hear great. Okay, yeah, okay. we're all good. I got worried. I got worried. Uh, yeah, it's too, the Africa too. thing, but that's well documented. The, the, yeah, the, the multiple yeah. fronts. Yeah. It's, it seems to get worse and, the more fronts they have, doesn't it? Of course. Yeah. You can confuse the air. It, pulls, it doesn't pull away from, from, from the Maginot line and the front line quite as much in, in the new patch as it did in vanilla or in unpatched. But there is definitely. Um, I think the most annoying part of the AI, though, is the friendly AI swamping your own front line with troops and just oh, destroying yeah. any chance you have of advancing. <laughs> oh, yeah. It deters faction play, doesn't it? Right. Yep. It, it 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 promotes solo play. It it deters puppets. It deters alliances. It just just go solo and you'll do a lot better. Yeah, I have a lot of people that are asking me saying, um, "Why don't you ever puppet? Why don't you ever try to join factions?" And I finally you did it. And the second I did it, the AI floods my front <laughs> lines, and I just can't yeah, do it's, anything. It's, I'm like, it's useless. This is why. There's not puppets a need for it. Puppets are not as much as a problem because they just tend to just give you all their troops anyway. Don't they? Don't seem to manually put troops on the front line. They're always just just have all True. my divisions. You do have, have more control over puppets. Like we could, in yep. the multiplayer series we did last, um, Alex, you had Germany as a puppet. It yep. can be used. Puppets, I think, can be used. But allies, factions, unless you're allies a multiplayer, can... it can be such a hindrance. Well, think about think about Spain and Greece. They actually did pretty well in their series. Yeah, yeah, true. But they didn't get involved. But that's because we brought them in pretty much when they weren't fighting on the mainland. Their troops never really fought on the mainland. They just kind of chilled in their own countries and gave us volunteers. Let, let's put it like this. Though. Allies are good if you can if you can manipulate the way the AI decides yeah. to help. Yeah. And if you yeah. are if you're Finland trying to fight Russia, Germany will flood your front line and starve your units. If you're India trying to fight Japan and Russia, and or Russia, uh, um, England will just flood your front line and starve your troops. So I think it all depends I think the, where you're fighting and who your allies are. Just to, another point to put on top there. It, it's not necessarily a problem that they co cause supply bottlenecks. It's the fact that they cause supply bottlenecks and then they just sit there. Yeah. They, they don't eat because because one of the penalties you get for supply is not controlling all provinces within a state. So surely, oh great, great, you've got a supply problem. So push further into the state. Then I don't know. I'm just going to sit here, sit yeah. on the line, and take attrition. Like okay. what? And well, you can't tell your allies to build infrastructure, and the AI yes. oh. never oh, builds oh, God. infrastructure. Oh, God. <laughs> and I don't What's get that Japanese puppet called. <laughs> What's that Japanese Menchuko? What? Menchuko. Menchuko. Yes. Oh, I have oh, a road. Please build a road. You meant literal oh, okay, you meant puppet. I thought we were talking about literal puppets here. And it's like, what does this have to do? <laughs> <laughs> no, like, what, but what is what is that one Japanese puppet? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Look it up yourself. I, don't, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, but what anyway. I don't get, your own units, the little exclamation mark, they're so sensitive. They're like, nope, we will not go in. There is not enough supply. We're staying right here. But your allies, let's do it, guys. We're just going to go in there. We're going to have some fun. And then your own troops are just like, nope. I, ha I get the go suspicion hungry. that go the yellow exclamation mark... <laughs> I think that yellow exclamation mark is part of some bright soul at Paradox going, hmm, we need some sort of mechanic to stop the AI from flooding units. I know, I'll do a little check, and then if I find out they can't do it, I'll, I'll warn the player with a little yellow exclamation mark, I'll cancel the move order, and the player will do it manually. And then he told the AI guy, hey dude, you should probably put this in the, in the, the normal AI too, and he oh, went, huh? I and know. he took lunch. That's the thing though, because the AI is just like, let's go in and do it. No! No, I, just I, like stay. I said, the wiring is there. It's just not hooked up to the AI AI. I, I agree. It's, it's I agree. The, yeah. So, so I think in the future, if we're going to interject kind of uh, what needs to change, I think there needs to be some kind of system that if you... I mean, this is not going to apply so much if you're not the leader of the faction, but if you are the leader of the faction, you get to say the lesser members what their priorities should be. Mm -hmm. and very similar to the way that, you know, like in Europe Universalis, for where you can set a priority, like a stance for your AI opponents. That it, it, it's not a lot because apparently in the new EU four, hint, 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 they're adding a new system where you have more strategic options for vassals. Well, it, let's say that even if a basic options like defensive, completely passive or aggressive would be awesome for HU HU four. But one other thing to note as well, uh, Hungary makes some great garrisons for France. I'll give them that. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. I remember Hungary in the Russia series building 70 divisions. God, I don't know where they got the supplies for that one. I think <laughs> they're always you... going for the battle, aren't they? <laughs> they're just like, 70, we're going to build 70. We have like five people left in the army, but we're going to have 70 divisions. Damn like, oh, you they're have to do that. They're filled with mice. But um, <laughs> if you... If you could only the same way you can tell the AI general to for for a theater you can tell or for for um, for an army you can say um, passive medium or aggressive. Uh, if there was a setting there for uh, yes AI please help out on this front line no AI I am fine go away please on this front line. Also uh, that yes would I, be... AI please make it hard for me. <laughs> Wait that's that's already a setting. <laughs> that's the default <laughs> setting. Yeah exactly. Yes. It, it, it's. I wish it was simple as that, but it's almost like everything we've talked about just now. It's, it's a combination of things, isn't it? Because I think the biggest deal so far is. I, I don't know if you you guys if you played Hearts of Iron two, but when I played Hearts of Iron two and I played as Germany, it was so hard to do Barbarossa. It was hell hard. You always you'd always try and try the situation of somehow ex exploiting France and taking them in 1939, and then doing this really really early Barbarossa. But it still never actually worked and i want that same challenge bag part and parcel of the lot of things we've mentioned right now that's what's going to make the game harder not this super freaking hard setting that they plan to make have, have you guys seen that in the dev diary that they plan to have a scaling system based on ai and it's it's literally yeah. giving the ai cheats wow. yeah i mean that's how civilization um, does it oh no let's be real here um oh. also okay on a side note on something that um talking about hoe3 um Something that I think they need to bring back desperately is they need to bring back scenarios. Yes, like seriously, I love scenarios. Those were the like, best. Like that. I mean, Spanish of course, Civil War. That one of was course, awesome. They're just going to sell as DLC, yeah. I'm sure. But I'd I pay mean, a DLC. I would pay for a DLC for that. Mm -hmm. no, don't I tell would. them that. Don't tell them that. Oh, they're going to do it regardless of what I say. I'd pay for it. Yes, yeah. As YouTubers, I. I they're kind of a one watch thing, aren't they? Though, if you think about it, when you've seen it once, do you need to see it again? You know, and, and there's going to be like at least a hundred YouTubers that are going to drill out the the I don't know the Operation Sea Lion scenario. You know, and once they've seen it, is that's pretty much done and dusted, isn't it? I wouldn't record a scenario, but I just love playing them on yeah. my own. I always love just trying oh, to I... find different creative ways to win without needing to go through the whole portion of building up my army. Right? It's just fun to get right into the action. It would depend on how much room there is for optimization and different strategies in a scenario, and also on the randomness of it. I remember the um, the Civil War scenario in the Spanish Civil War scenario in Hearts of Iron Three was a bit random, where it would you would get different troops would go to different sides by some sort of throw of the dice, which meant meant that every playthrough was slightly different. So, is but it a good familiar player. I would have never tried Hearts of Iron 3. Oh. I could never get multiplayer to work I thought the Hearts of Iron 3. Yeah, I always thought it would be kind of cool with this scenario because it kind of makes things super balanced, you know. There's there's no area of discussion. It's always, it gives one to one side, one to another. You know, there's not an area of gray area of like, oh, there's, oh, well, you won because you had more manpower. Oh, you had one because you had more production. You're like, oh, okay, it's fair, fair then. Yeah. Fair enough. Maybe. Well, like we'll set conditions, see, set conditions. I'm well, pretty sure scenarios are part of the DLC plan. I'm pre also pretty sure that different starting dates are part of the DLC plan. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about the Field Marshal edition? Because some of the bonuses didn't actually make a lot of sense to me. Because we, we all understood the soundtracks, the extra little bits and models and whatnot. But he also mentioned expansion pack one. Did, yeah. Were you all aware of this? What Does anyone have any idea what that means? Because it's so generic, no. you know? That's I got why it. I bought but... the Field Marshal thing, I think. Yeah, same. Yeah, I want this generic I'm... named expansion. Like, what is it going to be? Is it going to be, like, a scenario pack or something? Because, like, if it's just, like, sprites, I'm going to be a little... Oh, I'm so like, annoyed. Sprite ex <laughs> well, it says expansion, though, and expansion should be gameplay, not visuals yeah. or audio. I'm pretty I want to sure say it's if... DLCs. I'm wondering if, if it's well, going to be them trying to pack in what... The, you remember East versus West? They cancelled that like a couple months ago or however long ago. Right. I'm wondering if they're going to try to add like whatever they had there oh, as no. another start time in Hearts of Iron No, 4. no, no, no. That, that, that. I, I don't think they're going to do it, but I think it would be interesting. 
What was the start time? Why there? did they cancel? Yeah, can we talk uh, about this just for a brief moment? Cause yeah, it was a problem with the studios and Paradox, uh, like the, the, the publisher, because, I mean, the development team had nothing to do with it. I mean, they're under the publisher, as far as I know. But so, basically, so was it, it was just... A, was it, uh, no, no, no. It was... Oh. So, uh, do you guys know Darkest Hour, right? For yeah. uh, yep. Hearts of Iron 2? Yep. It's basically the same idea for Hearts of Iron 3. It's a, it's a standalone game based off of the same engine of Hearts of Iron 3 that was supposed to be in the gap between Hearts of Iron 3 and Hearts of Iron 4. It was going to be a Cold War scenario. And it just got cancelled oh. because of a disagreement between the publisher and what was going on with the developer. Because the developer that was making... Uh, what is it? East versus East. West is not related to Paradox besides the, the deal they had. Right, okay. Kind of like Arsenal Democracy, that was similar, wasn't it, as well? That was an independent... Exactly. Exactly. Kind of modest turn developers, yeah. Yes, and there's another one too. There's the secret weapons of the Wehrmacht or something like that, which was a DLC for Hearts of Iron 3 that ended up not being supported because it was basically a paid mod and the modder didn't get paid to maintain it. So when the game got patched, the DLC never got patched. So... It's basically a dead DLC. Hmm. Can ah, this is I'm drifting There's away. There's been a lot here, of but, that in Paradox. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I got to give them that because I mean it's kind of cool that they're bringing in kind of it, it's it's almost a similar era of gaming. You know, like when Valve started to like involve modders in in their engine as well because yep. they because Counter Strike started out as a mod and then it became this full thing and now it's even bigger than Half Life is and it's kind of cool because of that Fortress same era is kind of where. Uh, oh, was it? I think Team Fortress was in house. I think I'm not sure. Anyway, it was the same kind of era when that was happening, and I guess it's kind of cool that that Paradox was in on that as well. I think I, what I wanted to drift on to. I'm sorry, this is kind of drifting away from the main issue. We're not talking about AI anymore, but I feel like Cold War is just not as a colorful scenario as World War Two. But it's people seem to be really so up for it. Times. Uh, well, yes, with, because with World War Two was a colorful scenario. <laughs> oh. Well, that's what I mean, because World War II has a lot of borders changing dramatically over the periods of time. It has True. nations getting invaded and then returning borders. Because if you let's compare World War I to World War II, World War II has a lot of changes, different colors of the map. World War I has borders that move and then they're virtually static. You know what I mean? It, there's not this kind of <coughs> sway of back and forth you get. Well, well, yeah, but it wasn't a sway. It was, it was coring the map Germany and then end of the war. You know, it, there wasn't this kind of sway back and forth what Germany has. I, I don't know. I feel, I feel like no one kind of shares this opinion with me. I, people constantly give up these like, oh, it looks great. I'd love to see a World War, World War One. I would love to see a Cold War. I'd love to see Vietnam. And I'm thinking to myself, that would be so incredibly boring. Well, I think I think you're spot on with the World War Two being a very dramatic conflict. Oh yeah, compared to the other ones. Well, with the Cold War, the thing is, there's war. already <laughs> there's already mods out there. I feel like if they were to release it, it's kind of like, okay, I've already kind of played this. They'd have to do something. Very different. I You're think. trying you to tell me World War that yet? you would rather play a modded, like, different game than an official release. No, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I would still play it. I'm just saying it's not going to have the same hype it would have had as if there wasn't the mod. Because the fact is, there is already a mod out for that now, so people have already gotten a taste. For me, I'd be more excited for a Cold War standalone if there wasn't already the mod. That's my opinion. Why do you disagree? You see, I, I just personally think that I mean, like there was already there was already mods for I mean, okay, sure, Hearts of Iron Four may have a mod for Cold War, but there was already mods out before East and West came out. And you know, when East and West got released, how many people were just absolutely going buck wild for it? They were so hyped for it, so much so that, like, even though the game was unfinished, once it leaked, people still play it, and people actually made mods for it so that it worked and wouldn't crash. Like, there's a playable version of East versus West. May not have all the features in there, but that is indicative in of itself of the kind of hype it garnered. That is true. But I think the, the other issue is this wouldn't be a standalone. This would be an expansion, right? So they'd ha I still think they'd have to do something different to it to make it engaging. Because Didn't East versus West... Go the ahead. timeline in Hearts of Iron 3 to like 1955 or something? For a scenario. It was it only for a scenario. Only so 
the only time I can see a Cold War scenario working as a kind of a grand strategy game would be in some... I know this might seem kind of weird to think of it initially, but Victoria 2, because think about it, the Cold War isn't a war, really, is it? It's a war of wars, you know, and it, and, and it doesn't have that essence of front line and swaying back and forth. So it, it's almost like... It's almost like the Cold War is just a, a diplomacy room, almost, isn't it? You know what I mean? That's well, all it is. I it's actually not... really agree with you for that. I'd, I'd like to see, maybe not, obviously not on Victoria's 2 engine, Victoria 2 yeah. engine, but more of the whole balancing your economy focus and more focus on your industry, your economy, your population. Because that was Victoria 2. It had wars, but it had such a focus on trade, on your economy, you know, it... It had more of a government focus than a military focus. And I'd like to see that again, for Cold War. Yeah, yet again, I, I think that worked really well in Victoria too. I, I don't know about Paradox, but one thing they do incredibly well is they pinpoint areas of history that just are so incredibly good. I oh, mean, yeah. the, the scenario of EU4, the scenario of uh, Half Your Hearts of Iron and uh, Victoria 2. The, the, those areas of history are just so perfect for the, the kind of game mechanics they introduce. It, it's just it absolutely is genius. I don't even know having the grasp of concept. Okay. Cause it, cause you, 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 cause anyway, back to what I said before, yeah, the whole Cold War thing, yeah, I, I, I don't see how that's ever going to work in as a game other than... I don't, let, let's just let's just imagine paradox. Think of some miracle idea behind it. I don't know. Well, let me let me bring this back to a problem that I believe um, is kind of intrinsic, and I I've I've had this thought this whole time that I've been working on Millennium Dawn, is that honestly, Hearts of Iron Four is actually not the best game to really do a modern day mod with, because <gasps> the central concept. <gasps> yeah. Right. Right. The central concept for, you know, <laughs> modern day is not in an entire war, but the, the central concept for, you know, Hearts of Iron 4 is that there is going to be one war and it's going to involve the entire war. It, it's centered around World War II and it is a game made for World War II's concepts. When you try to bring it into the modern day where, in all honesty, this has been the most peaceful time in human history. It yep. really doesn't model as, as well. And you see, I've played the absolute hell out of Victoria 2's modern day mod. And Victoria 2, okay, see, I have a problem with Victoria 2 where the combat system, I hate the combat system in Victoria 2. And Hearts of Iron Force combat, the combat system, system in Victoria 2? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's a sideline, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. It's not a main part Literally, of the game, is it? Yeah. It's just it's it's closer to risk than it is even anything mm -hmm. else, really. I agree and, with you there. That is definitely true. It's so randomized. The problem the problem is that the uh, but however the population system and the political system it's able to model the modern world so much better. Like we have at least have political decisions. Like events that we can do in Victoria 2, but in the modern day mod, you just you, you can't you don't even have political decisions. So you have to either have events that have events that you can't see. So you don't even know if you're going to be able to do events. You just have to let the player like, oh, here you got some random goals that you didn't even know about, and here's this event to I don't know do whatever. Or you have a focus tree, but then to make a focus tree, it doesn't work quite the same way as like political decisions unless you just have a focus tree that's not connected. And you just have requirements everywhere for different ones, and they're not connected. Which even that doesn't seem to be the best solution. More but, like decisions. Yeah, exactly. Like you'd have, like you almost need that to really be able to do something. Like, for example, everybody wants to create like the European Union or you know a union state. But the problem is that you either like in Victoria Two, EU Four, all that. It is made by doing a decision. Whereas in Hearts of Iron Four, you don't have that. You have the focus tree, maybe, but. Like I was saying, that's not really the greatest way to fix that problem. No, I think I think you're right. And also, simulating mo uh, uh, f unless you're doing a specific World War Three mode exactly or, or scenario, then modern warfare is pretty boring from a strategy from a grand strategy standpoint because the conflicts are so one sided there are with with a few notable exceptions world war 2 was the last sort of interesting conflict from a grand strategy perspective in my opinion because things at least from the perception of the people participating in it 
it was up in the air. Any, it could go anyway. Uh, hindsight being what it is, people can discuss whether or not Germany had any theoretical chance of winning the war or if something could have happened to change the course of the war. But from the, at least from the standpoint of the soldiers fighting and the civilians being bombed, it looked like anyone could win. It was anyone's battle. Modern combat, not so much. It goes more towards political will to keep bombing or whether or not you define something as a war or... It's a police action. Uh, we have a UN mandate to go in and do something strange here. And it's never a question of winning or losing. It's sort of achieving weird political goals or not achieving them, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I guess the only kind of system that I could imagine it would work is some kind of system of great powers, you know, and, and, and an issue where these great powers are not competing to control the world. They're kind of competing around a diploma table because that's how kind so of the modern Victoria world is like with the, G, the G, with like yeah, the, the G8 Cold war. and whatnot that's what i mean but, but they, they could they could merge those diplomacy um aspects and also merge the kind of war theater of of hearts of iron and that's kind of where the nice balance would be but how would you make a uh, world war three scenario is sort of well would that just end in nukes and that is, is true. You, That's something you have to definitely see, consider in that. Because the AI won't use surely. nukes in Hearts of Iron 4. They never use nukes. <laughs> I've never okay. once had me nuked by AI. See, before I started... Well, actually, when I was first started working on Millennium Dawn, I actually... Um, right, so I, I had my China series, which most of you probably didn't watch, but that's fine. Um, and the interesting I thing in the China series... <laughs> no, no I, I, I don't actually care. But I'm just going to go pull the, that open on a separate tab. So anyway, uh, it was it was a democratic China series, and I played it using a mod. Anyway, it was a lot of fun, and I had a really interesting scenario. So basically, we win World War II, um, and the whole world is democratic. But of course, since uh, there were some like requirements that weren't met, the UK was able to. Um, people missing me on Steam. I thought I turned that off. The UK was able to use one of their focuses to. Um, Go to war, go to war with uh, Germany, and Germany was in my faction. They joined my faction at the end of the war. So after World War II, I basically had a sort of Operation Unthinkable, except we were both allies on each side. So at the end of what? the war, I controlled almost the whole world because it was me, just China, and Germany. Germany died instantly because they didn't have any troops because it was literally right after the war began. And I ended up taking over the whole world. Um, and after after that, I was like, wow, this is a really interesting scenario. So I actually stopped working on Millennium Dawn for a while, and I was like, okay, maybe I should, like, make a mod out of this, okay? That's still basically modern day, right? You could have it take place in modern day with modern day everything and basically just restore all the borders, and, I don't know, you could find some story. I made up, like, a, a story about, you know, how uh, China, instead of, like, an American-led century, because, you know, they say that the uh, around the Cold War was the American century, instead you have sort of a, a Chinese century, a Sino-centric century, where they hold the power, but eventually a sort of United Nations breaks down. And the key factor for the alliance not being upheld is the fact that there are no nukes. Because if you look back, say, at, uh, like, the Indian-Chinese conflicts, right? in like the 70s and I think maybe the 80s. I don't quite remember the dates. Maybe it's the 90s. I, yeah. I don't know. Those were real, full conventional warfare. And the only thing that really stopped them from going all out is because each side had nuclear weapons, right? And so in a sense, if the world didn't have nuclear weapons, I am sure we would have already have had a World War Three scenario. Just without so a doubt. So it's all... So I guess you're going to kind of paint the world as kind of a, a fan fiction, haven't you, to kind of create the scenario that you want, <laughs> right, haven't you? Right, exactly. That's, that's oh. what I'm saying. It's like the only way you could really stage a World War III without nukes that was a conventional warfare like uh, World War II is you have to create yourself a scenario where there were no nukes to begin with. Because otherwise... Well, Oppenheimer. Well, that is, that's possible. With the whole push now to disarm, you could have some kind of major event where countries finally take the step and disarm and then some massive political or economical crash or whatever that basic scenario for world war three world runs out of oil whatever happens and then you can actually have that kind of war without the threat of nukes because the fact is think, uh, people are pushing for disarmament with a fantasy scenario like that is mm -hmm. putting the nuclear genie back in the bottle 
even if even if all the major nuclear powers decide to scrap 99% of their uh, stockpile tomorrow, uh, as soon as things start heating up again, again, it would probably be yeah, cheaper exactly. to build nukes than tanks. Cold War Part Two. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why there's not many modern games out there with this kind of grand strategy scenario because you can do it in an, in an RTS sense. That makes sense because you're not focusing on the grand scale, but with grand strategy, a modern setting exactly. is so much more difficult and so much more complex. And in most of the cases where there is a modern scenario, declaring war is incredibly difficult and you get punished to for quote it. a certain get famous YouTuber, where is the core gameplay loop? What's, what are you going to be doing? In what is your war, core you know? message? Yeah, is your core <laughs> message. Stay on message. Stay on message. Uh, no, but what 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 are you going to be doing in a in a modern day scenario? What what's going to be the sort of bread and butter of your game? What what what's the player going to be trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. And paradox games, um, to their credit, have always been kind of vague about that whole thing. It's sort of you do whatever you want to do. Here's here's a bunch of toys and go play with them. <laughs> um, Crusader Kings and European Universalis are, are extremely sort of just just do whatever you want. Um, Hearts of Iron is slightly more focused in that unless you do something very weird, World War Two will trigger. So you're gonna have to fight that. But I think we've drifted. Sorry, I just don't don't mean to interrupt, but we have drifted very very far away from AI. <laughs> well, um, oh, that's, that's well, natural, well, so. technically, we've actually already drifted on to a couple other topics yeah, we discussed, so not, which not is modding that. and the potential. Like the future Are you implying of the game. we have so prepared let's... topics for this? Yes, I am <laughs> implying that. So if, if that's the case, then, if, if we're talking about the dream mod, let's talk about the, the dream feature. What, what would you guys like to see Paradox add to Hearts of Iron for vanilla to, to enhance the game? What would you like to see that expansion pack 1 actually become? Proper supplies. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a let's, patch. Let's, let's talk about mod. new features, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, as a feature, I mean, as a deeper feature, I, I want a logistics DLC. I Fair want enough. the ability to produce yeah, yeah. fuel, to produce ammunition, to produce food, produce uniforms, move that to the front, and make sure my troops are fed and clothed and have and bullets for their guns. If you were to actually create an on-land supply line, like yep. you actually have to say, this is the line I want them to take. I need. To or, use, a create lane. Specific, or a shipping lane, which they had, kind of. They still have that in Hearts of Iron 4, but it's really And they had it complex. in Hearts of Iron 3. I they did have back. it in Hearts of Iron 3. That was awesome, because you'd actually have to worry about creating escorts. If you didn't have escorts, then y you'd get in this spiral. All your ships are being destroyed, so you can't make more escorts, but then um, you just have to find another way to get the supplies. This is a, this is okay, a point so in between the the, the AI and the, and the engine limitations and mods, because right now... Out of the four different kind of convoys there are in the game, only two of them can be intercepted. The two others are immortal. And that's a huge problem when it comes to how easy it is to, to do Sea Lion, how easy it is to invade the Americas, how easy it is to in, invade uh, the islands of the Pacific. It's a huge problem, in my opinion. And, and it makes the game not very World War II-ish. It's kind of an issue of the fact that when you do sink a convo, you have absolutely no idea what was in it. That's, that's a big issue for me. If they're going to add any kind of feature that's so small, surely there should be some kind of intelligence report after when the battle's ended. Like you can target some certain certain supply lines. It's one no, of two no, no, I mean like on the battle summary screen, when you've sunk a convoy and you click on the actual battle summary and you actually see that four convoys were sunk. When I hover my icon over that, I want to see what was in those convoys to give me an indication of what I was hitting. Was I hitting well, uh, a transport convoy with actual divisions? Was I hitting metal convoy imports? That's what exports? I mean though, because then you could target certain supply convoys if you know your enemy is heavily reliant on metal, which it's not that hard to figure out if you look at their <laughs> units and their resources. You could say, well, it seems they're primarily shipping metal along these supply lines, so I can target that, forcing the enemy to make a similar reaction to defend those supply lines. Yep. It, it's an action and a response. No, That's... Proper, proper sea lanes with proper uh, wolf packs and U-boats hunting for ships and proper escorts, that's a big thing for me, and getting proper supply lines on <laughs> land with proper supplies being transported on land. I really, really hope they're going to make a logistics DLC. And then the people who don't I like don't... it can turn it off or not use it. That's fine. 
Well, well that, that's a good point because I think that's interesting because there is a theme of Paradox where they introduce new expansion, new expansion, new expansion, and they tend to bloat their game. And you've noticed that, Alex, as well with Crusader Kings 2 and the Ooh. kind of the, yes. the backlash against <laughs> the new... And it, there is a tendency... Europa that, Rosales is a good I, example too. Yeah, yeah. I, do you know what? I actually downloaded the last two expansions and I loaded up the other day. And you know, I was really shocked by the fact that how just simple things are kind of very complex now. I, I can't just fabricate what I, I need to send spy. I need to have a spy network into the name. Yep. Like, what? what? Like, are you actually enhancing the game there? Or are you just kind of putting up more walls? Because that could be the issue. They could put up more walls in Hearts of Iron 4. And, and to, to be fair, is that enhancing the game? Or yes. is that kind of yes. just. For Hearts would, of Iron 4, that's... yes. Because yes. Hearts of Iron 4 is People streamlined. Europa sports. Universalis at start yeah. was complicated enough. At start, it had enough of a learning curve. You don't need to make gonna... that more complicated. Hearts of I... Iron 4 is so streamlined, right it needs more complexity. Are we yeah, the right think... people to say that, though? Because no. we kind of very familiar with the previous Hearts of Iron games, aren't we? So when we, we dive into Hearts of Iron 4... Well, then you run into yeah. a whole separate argument. Yeah. You run into entirely <laughs> separate arguments, which is the priority. New players that are trying to get into the game, or players that already know how to th play the game. The way to... S it's you should old. maybe have almost like two versions of the game. A more simplified version and a more complex version. Uh, Allow that me would, to interject. Uh, that would be, of course, <laughs> impossible to develop, but... <laughs> Iron 3 had arcade... Uh, supplies on or off. You could you could turn off the supply requirement in Hearts of Iron 3 as a standard setting in the game. Um, yeah. And Crusader Kings 2, with the latest patch, you are allowed to customize your game experience. You can now turn on and off a myriad of different settings in the game. Everything from shattered retreating to females holding titles yeah. to Everything is not customizable, and I think that is the future of Paradox games. And you see them doing that. I would that love that. I would love that in Hearts of Iron 4. Yeah, so they're going to do that in Hearts of Iron 3. And 4, I'm 90% I'm sure that you're going to see a much more diversified setup screen where you can see, okay, I want to play with this and this and this, but not that and that and that. Just like the old air, uh, flight simulators back in the 90s and early 2000s, where you could turn on and off like 20 different settings for flaps or weather or... Uh, slippery runways or unlimited ammunition and all that sort of thing okay i i feel like i'm gonna quote now yeah i'm i'm, I'm almost interjecting opinions that aren't my own the stolen the secondhand ones and these are the total biscuits perspective on difficulty I, I guess i'm opposed to a scaling difficulty i'm opposed to it I, I feel like there should be a standard mode that should be easier than get challenging as it gets the game there should be a hard mode for someone who's already completed normal and then there could should be a custom for maybe what you're just describing there to your own specific flavor to your specific taste i, I don't like this idea of jumping into a game and i'm bombarded with these a, a vast number of scalable options and scales there needs to be a standard there needs to be a hard and there needs to have a custom otherwise i feel like you, you you, you are you are alienate you you are doing exactly what you just said before you, you are alienating that person who wants a more simplified game and just well, wants to hit that normal button go well that can happen too you can have a default number of settings you just click the default box and you get a random amount of settings that is more easy for a new player because somebody that's already experienced is going to take the time to go through all of those settings and choose what they want somebody that's new just says I'll hit the default button and go from there. And it's not that hard to add a default button. Somebody and just who's pick new a few to a settings. grand strategy game should pay, click the beginner button. Yeah. I think the issue that I find is that it becomes very black and white. And the whole, the more you feature custom features you add, the more gray the whole what normal mode is quote unquote normal true. mode true. And, and, and I, I hate this concept of loading a playthrough on YouTube and then and then having to beg the question like what <laughs> sentence is this guy using you know what yeah is he is he doing really well because he's put it on uber uber scooby noob mode or <laughs> is he is he is he is he insanely good and I just don't know you know I don't like that and I uh, I don't think you're enhancing the game when you're adding more sliders you know, that's my point I'm 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 preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's a complicated issue in my opinion, but I see your point. I as long as there, but but I I think there should be default settings for the game, and then I like the idea of customizing your difficulty. That's uh, where I'm they, with you. They, 
Yeah. yeah, they might have made a mistake in Crusader Kings 2 in that when you start a new game, you're always presented with the screen. But you don't have to actually do anything to the screen. You just click whatever and move along. Um, but when it comes to YouTubers and, and watching people on YouTube, I watched, um, I think it was a Roomba who was doing a, a Black Plague Let's Play. And he, he switched two settings and then he started playing. And, and I mean, that's what I would do too. I would... I would start by showing people my setup screen and see this is how I'm going to play the game and this is our settings and th this is why I think this will be challenging and this is how I think it might be easy and then go. And mm. uh, But mostly I'm whenever I'm looking at Let's Plays I want to see standard or hard difficulty and I want to see Iron Man mode or you know Bronze Man with Honor System something like that depending on crashes and stuff like that. Um, and then... I want to see people get their ass handed to them. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not the target audience. I'm not the target audience, but I think there might be a good third group there of someone who likes to see something wacky and unusual and unexpected as well. That's another thing. I'm, I'm, I'm self-promoting myself. It's a self-promotion. Oh, glorious self-promotion. I, pr I did a Democratic Germany one, and I said myself when I started the game that I would be a pacifist. I would only attack as kind of a defender. I would defend. And obviously, as the game went on, it became less viable to do that because World War War happens regardless if Germany starts it or not, it, it happens. The, the events in the game kind of make wars happen and world tension skyrockets and whatnot. But it created this really wonky scenario where like, the world was separated into these three factions of the Allies. There were this German uh, faction that I created. Then there was like this French faction as well. And it was so wacky and unusual. People really loved it. And I, do you know what? The game reflected none of my skill. None. I, I barely even played that game. I feel like I was, it was, I was a spectator. The fact that I was just clicking. You know what I mean? It wasn't challenging but people loved it people said there was just wacky this is fun i want more of it so there's some there's something out there not only for the challenge you player or the casual but there's also something out there who wants to see this story this role play well, that's, this that's wacky what you scenario call emergent gameplay isn't it uh, subscribe to my channel to see more wacky gameplay yes link down below. <laughs> yes. and where can they buy your shirts dave yeah would you like yeah. to give them that link to lightning yeah, big lightning bolt on your chest. Big lightning bolt. That's not copyrighted at all, is it? You, nope. can, get, you, can, get, you can get mugs with my face on it as well, <laughs> and uh, uh, keychains, little cute keychains, and wedding rings yeah. as well. We're and also, if wedding rings. Wants to nice. see, see face cams for these other guys, <laughs> let us know in the description down below. Because <laughs> I'm, not I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Face reveal. No, Facebook yeah. FIBA releases his face. Go go to that awkward guy and and download his videos until he puts on a face cam. Just download, download? everything. Oh, he downvote! Does. I thought I said download. Download his videos. We're, we're like, doxing oh, you right now. We're gonna do find that. his face. <laughs> oh, then 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 I will just quit YouTube. I don't care. I will put my time into other things. Okay, I think we've got you time for one more topic. <laughs> I actually do though. That's the thing. I bear. I barely been squeezing in enough time to record videos Good lately. Lie. I'm so busy. Anyway, is it, anyway, is, we're moving on. Is there one Alex, last favorite topic? On. Someone want, um, yeah, so okay. is there the, one last topic? What favorite of yours you want to inject as a final finale? Well, pretty much the last main thing I think we can really talk about is where do we think Hearts of Iron 4 stands in terms of multiplayer and how does it compare to past games? And what would okay, you like so, to see different? Okay, so I think I want to check my dev diary experiences because I feel like I study them like I'm, I'm, I'm cracking the enigma or something. But I, th there was a note on one of the dev diaries that they're going to introduce full hot seating. Okay, so if anyone doesn't actually know, right now you can only host a game and join it from the very start or from a save game point from the very start as a brand new host. So hot seating will give the feature so people can actually jump into the game mid-session. So if someone wants to disconnect, which happens all the time, which is so much freaking frustrating you can have the ability to jump in mid-game and just rejoin from that point on there on or if you wanted to leave the player out and continue as an ai whatever you feel like and uh, I, to that point i was when i heard about that i was like i just want to hold back i don't want to i don't want to play multiplayer but then i found alex and i fell in love and then we we made sweet love, sweet, sweet love. Nice. oh god okay mm. <laughs> oh, no go on sorry if you want to continue about love these, um <laughs> well, I, I agree with you on the hot seat thing, because how many times in our own multiplayer series have we just one person disconnects and we have to restart the entire game? And it it's wasn't just... that bad, to be honest. That, that one day, one though. Session. That one yeah, day. That one session where everything was, was screwy. Where I just but... stopped editing things. <laughs> like, I'm not yeah, editing really this. I, like the... I think everybody lost an episode or so. <laughs> I lost oh, yes. half yes. of one episode. 
Uh, yeah, Seth, you lost a few, didn't you? Yeah, we don't talk about it. <laughs> we, don't we don't talk, talk about it. it. <laughs> That's not That's... something we speak about here. <laughs> we don't speak about these things. We don't want to talk about it. Quiet. Um... No, but I, I think I think the the stability of of Hearts of Iron Four compared to other Paradox releases has been absolutely stellar when it comes to multiplayer. Oh yeah, yeah. crap. Yeah, compared to joined. other. Yeah. 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 So so they've done a great job there. I, I appreciate the because we we can we can sort of we can hate the AI as much as we want, but the fact is we've played this game for way too long to say we don't like it. Oh um, yeah, I love the game. That's the thing. Yeah, and it's stable. It, it. I think I've had like one crash through six hundred or something hours of gameplay. So, it's it's a stable game. And, uh, but what was the question again? You had some sort of what would we like to for multiplayer? What like, would you like to see? Or yeah, is there any changes within multiplayer that you'd like to see anything added or any new features that they could possibly incorporate in multiplayer? The feel like needs some kind of randomization if we want to play it kind of competitively of player versus player i think there's going to be something that gives a random feel to kind of let players dive in and ex into to a stage where it's like if you're playing as the soviet union you don't feel like you've got this crazy advantage because of the insane resources insane production insane divisions you know manpower and whatnot you know Are it you feels implying like be... that the soviet union is overpowered just because we're about to do multiplayer where i am the soviet union <laughs> no i actually well, oh, you know, so really huh? It's a secret. People can't Spoilers. know. People can't no, know. No. We need to promote the hell out of this thing. We do. We do. Maybe we can put that as an, a little plug at the end of this video. Yeah, we'll do, plug, we'll do that plug, as the plug. last thing. We'll, we'll talk about the, the multiplayer thing we have planned. So, um, anyway, Dave, you were saying a random element for competitiveness? Yeah, it's, it's some kind of randomization element where it, it, if players, all players, major factions, UK, Germany, Italy, Soviet Union, whatever, etc. There is like a, a random button and that would randomize uh, the amount of factories they start with, the manpower they start with. It, it gives, I know this is kind of really going to get on the nerves of someone who really likes that, that historical itch. And I am one of those guys myself. But if you want a system where players are going to face players and you can actually find out who is the most skillful Hearts of Iron player. The only real way of doing it is to have some randomization. You know, let I, the player be unexpected and surprised with what they see in the game. Wrongly disagree. And the reason why I strongly disagree is that that will just encourage people throwing games. Uh, yeah, I it will. People will just say, like, oh, yeah, it's I think unbalanced. The answer is exactly the opposite. I think the answer would be to say, okay, this is a this is multiplayer competitive mode, so the three different alliances will have in total the exact same amount of factories and they will have the exact same amount of manpower and they will have the exact same amount of units to start with. So you would have a setting where where everything is balanced from the get-go and no holds barred, they can declare war whenever and however they want and stuff like that. I think, that be... I think the reason why a lot of people do because I've, I've watched a few multiplayer scenarios on youtube and it almost seems like they're always decided from like within the first two or two episodes you know what i mean it always seems like so blatantly obvious and the only conclu conclusion that i can come to the reason why is just that pe pe people don't play hearts of iron kind of competitively it's it's kind of the, the, the ai mix up <sighs> it, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. That's why I'm proposing this randomness, or in your case, what you propose is pretty good as well. The whole idea of, of a static system as well. Balance. Yeah. You start with yeah, a balanced it's... scenario. Yeah. It's like you, you don't sit down and play chess and to discover who's the best chess player by everybody rolling a die six for how many queens they get. Yeah. I still feel that I need... Cause, I mean, I played StarCraft 2, ranked mode, 1v1. I mean, I don't think... All right, maybe I'm blowing my own trumpet here, but I can't, I can't think of any other scenario where it feels like so much is on the line for you and you are facing one other person. You can't blame your teammate, it's 1v1. So I, I honestly feel like I want to play a scenario where I want to find out if I am a significantly better player than that other person. And I don't feel like I get any better if I'm playing against someone who has some kind of unfair advantage. Well, because let, okay, then let me, let me just results. interject this real quick. I don't think Hearts of Iron game is the correct game if you're looking for a balanced, competitive mm -hmm. gameplay to test your skill. It's just not that kind of game. Um, I don't deny that. I don't RTSs deny that. But I, 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 the way to do like it, though, to be, to be honest, if, if you were looking for, for a way to determine the best Hearts of Iron player uh, in a in a sort of... Um, in a... 
absolute sense. You would have to do several consecutive battles where you would have like two or three teams and they would rotate through the nation so that you sort of... <laughs> Uh, let's say you had six players, two for each each faction, and then they would do. Uh, then they, the first team one would be uh, England, uh, France. Team two would be Germany, Japan, and team three would be Russia and whatever. That's a very <laughs> big time investment, though. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but something if, like if that. Like games a, can last hours. Yeah, if you hours. wanted to do a tournament where you would just do, sort of a ranking where you would say this is the best heart of Iron Pain, you would ha you would have yeah, to find something you have to, yeah, you have to. do yeah, yeah. well as any nation over time. Yeah, I, I, do, I do agree. Yeah, I agree. House of Iron Four ain't, ain't this kind of esports game that's going to be a competitive esports. It's esport not. Anytime it's soon. Definitely. But 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 that doesn't mean it shouldn't try. I don't mean I, there shouldn't be a. There's, it'd be really nice if there was something that that gave an ability for people to play competitively if they wanted to. I agree. And now I think I'm that's... talking about this. It gets it gets me excited to try and jump on host, have some randoms join, and see if I can stomp them just to see. I don't know. Just to just to <laughs> see if it's possible. Because I I guess from my perspective, I I, I like to see progress you know what i mean like with my youtube channel sure. as well if, if if i'm not improving if things aren't getting better i'm asking myself why 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 and, and i don't get better uh, unless i challenge myself hang on wasn't there a system in one of the creative assembly total war games where you could enable people to hot join yeah. battles yeah. in single player game? yeah yeah i remember i think that was in napoleon shogun. and shogun yeah it, started it was napoleon, napoleon and shogun. and shogun where it was like yeah you could have something like that for Hearts of Iron, where where you could sort of troll people. I disagree with that. Nobody would join. It like, well, it doesn't would... work the same way. Because oh, I would battles. definitely join if I could just jump in and be <laughs> France in somebody's Germany game. Oh, that would be so hilarious. <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like that wouldn't Alex has work. Well. Your world. <laughs> yeah. Right. You a lot of times you just get either some really crappy player that's going to be worth worse than the AI or somebody that's insanely impossible. good and is going to wreck you. Yes, I know it's impossibly <laughs> worse than the AI, but I don't even think that's and the trolls. Problem, to be honest. Then you open it to trolls, people that are just going to hoard their units in one city so <laughs> they all die the, of lack of organization. You just turn off the the feature, but I don't think that's a problem. I think the problem is is that. It doesn't work as well as a Total War game because a Total War game has two game states. They have the campaign map, the turn-based campaign map, yep. and then they have the real-time battles. Whereas in Hearts of Iron 4, it's just one thing. I just don't think it works as well because there's no separation of the playing fields. To be honest, I think multiplayer in, in, Hearts of, in the Hearts of Iron series has always been strongest when you're either doing cooperatively one big nation so you can share the workload, or when you're doing co-op as allies doing comp stomps, or when you're doing a role-play heavy, let's enjoy the game for what it is and don't not really care about who actually wins the war, but more of putting up a good fight and sort of uh, good sportsmanship kind of thing, where you where you go, okay, well, you beat me as as Germany invading my Russia thing, but I was trying this thing and that thing and that didn't work, and so, yeah, good fight, good night. Uh, the whole competitive thing where Nana Nana Boo Boo, I'm better than you, not the best game for it because there's always some excuse where the AI fucked me over or my <laughs> allies didn't help me or... Uh, yeah. So Every time somebody mes mentions the AI, I just start laughing. I just can't <laughs> not laugh. It's a joke. It is, it is a f pretty funny thing. But, no, I, I, th I think... Like I said, competitive mode for, for Hearts of Iron is is not really viable, but that's not to say you can't play against each other, but you have to have the mindset that this is not going to determine who's the better player, more like the goal would have to we'll be for see. everybody to have a good time. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. see. India will we'll rise see. again. <laughs> well, that's right, you're India. <laughs> ah. The greatest <laughs> nation in Asia, by no I, means. I border you, don't I? <laughs> Russia, Russia through... doesn't border India. No. No, I do through no. Siang... Siang... King? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh. over the Himalayas. Oh, no. Oh, no, it, there's no. like a really thin border between Afghanistan yeah. and India. That's the one yeah. you're talking about. No, don't border, but damn, you're right. It's very, very close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, all right, guys. We're starting to get off the multiplayer topic here. So if we wanted to quickly, as you guys yeah. said, discuss the multiplayer series... Yeah, let's do really that. Really quick, and then we can end this. 
podcast. Does everybody so, seem oh, to okay. love our previous uh, uh, campaign where we were uh, the Between Two Seas Alliance thing? Yeah. So we decided yeah. to do a new one. Explain and the full scenario and then we'll kind of just tell you what we're all playing and how, yeah. what to expect. So we're okay. bringing in some new people this time. We're bringing in Ooh. Dave, of course. We're bringing Hi. in, um, if some of you might know, Glenn Games. Um, and yeah, his friend, he, what, what was his channel's name? GT Games? Rated GT. Rated GT Games. Rated GT. So we're having a total of seven people, and I think Alex wanted to say something about it. I heard yeah, you. we have seven people, so we, we thought, well, we could do sort of a Axis versus Comintern versus Allies scenario, but we decided uh, it would be sort of... The problem being... Like Dave alluded to, a lot of multiplayer games seems to be seem to be decided very early on, and we didn't want that. So we decided we'll start off with the common turn on one side and the allies on the other stomping the axis, like it was historically. And once that's done, the common turn and the allies will be allowed to turn on each other. So to facilitate this, we have divided the countries as follows. We have human players on one side for England, France, America... And India, that would be the allies, mm. stinky, yes. stinky allies, dirty communist, Ooh. no, dirty, dirty capitalist pig dogs. And then on the other <laughs> side, the glorious... <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> D- Dave, you're turning on your own team. <laughs> we're, we're dropping <laughs> subtle <laughs> hints to what side we're on here. Just subtle little hints. <laughs> stinky of what... communist, I agree. Stinky communist. No, you said, you said capitalists at the end, though, and you said, I agree. <laughs> turning on your no, own factions. I... Uh, I, 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 agree. I, 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 I agree, Alex. I agree. <laughs> Good. We're all agreed. We should return to gold standard. Now, um, <laughs> on the other side, there is the Soviet Union, I think Romania, and I want to say... PRC. China? Yeah, People's the Republic People's of Republic China. of China. That's going to be China. interesting. I honestly was not China. paying attention to anything that you're saying, but I just figured China's probably the answer. <laughs> China is always the answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So sh- should we tell them who who everybody's playing, or should we just? Why not? I don't. There's okay, no I'll start. Yeah. I am going to be the glorious, the fabulous, the most awesome faction of all. I will be Gandhi with nukes, and I will defend <laughs> our land of India to, against all foes. And the border I'm going to be focusing on the most is that little one between Afghanistan, because I'm watching you, Alex. You dirty <laughs> communist scum! I am going to come for you, and I am going to get you. This feels like WrestleMania. <laughs> I'm, I'm going for you, and I'm going to lay down the heat on you. <laughs> you I feel level three, Alex. Four, level three forts on that board. Level nine, ten forts on that border is probably. <laughs> We level three. Oh, I'm going level ten then. <laughs> level ten forts in the Himalayas. That's going to be really easy to crack, isn't it? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> all right. Okay, I'm done. You go. The millions of men that would be needed to crack that. Yep. And and no surprise, I am yes the glorious Stalin Soviet Empire Russia thing that's going to yeah da. all comers. Yeah, no da da. Yeah, I, yeah, we have vodka. We have we have great vodka. We have the best vodka. We have a really good vodka. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to be playing Stop. the United Kingdom because Royal Britannia rules the waves. I'm sorry, I had to quote <coughs> that. Excuse me. I ha- it's my turn. You are um, great, no. oh glorious master. You are yes. all great, oh master. Just, just watch, <laughs> Alex. Watch, watch the Baltic Sea. My ships are coming for you. Prove, uh, improve our infrastructure, sir. Empty improve our infrastructure. Make, make us glorious again. I'm going to reclaim my empire that I technically still have. Good luck with that. I'm, I'm going for Belgium's. I want Belgium's land in Africa. Waffles. I'm going for it. Waffles. And Seth? Uh, Seth? Ah, uh, yes. I am, of course, playing as America. America. Fuck you. Yeah. Exactly. Great song. Exactly. That's, that's all that really needs to be said. We're coming flying high. Freedom through the sky. Freedom. Delivering freedom. Yep. Yep. Well, those, well I guess we at this blue. point the red scare wasn't really in effect. That didn't come into effect until that was until later. Well, when they got the bomb, the war, it really started. That's going to be the concept for the let's play, though, isn't it? Let's just say it happened early. <laughs> well, it depends how quickly we can defeat the Axis. Well, it's, it's pretty much guys... Operation Unthinkable. More yeah. or less. How, how do you think we're gonna? How quickly do you think we will have defeated the 
evil axis fascists. Mm, oh, quick. That's a good question. Quick. If we're both contributing in that, it's not going to take long. Well, no. let me put it this no. way. You better be contributing because you can bet your ass I'm going to be kicking their asses. So if you want any of that juicy land in, in, um, in Europe, you, um, you should probably declare pretty quick. Yeah, we'll yeah. be watching for the purge. Oh, Mr. and we're democracy. We'll yeah, I know. We are we're I'm, I'm not doing the purge. I'm doing the civil war. Ah, uh, yes, oh. of course you are. <laughs> what? Who needs to strike? Just get a second to let that sink in. Just like, whoa, wait, what? Well, okay. Okay. The nah, Afghani board doesn't seem as big anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This is going to be All fun. All right, boys. So, it's let you know, uh, my voice, I am the British guy. I am Dave Feedback Gaming, youtube.com forward slash Dave Feedback Gaming. I've got the word Dave in the front because I'm Dave. Do you see how that adds up? My name's Dave. What was your and, name again? Uh, yeah, wait, wait, what? My name is Fred. Dave. Fred. Dave. Oh, okay, Dave. Fred. Dave. Dave. That branding. Daniel? The branding. Dave, Daniel, <laughs> no, I can't do Give that, me a subscribe, Dave. guys. Uh, the, why you should subscribe to me is I I don't know. I, I guess I'm trying to try something different, try wacky scenarios and whatnot. If you guys like hilarious, dumb kind of role play, kind of comedy style playthroughs, I'm the guy for you. And that's that's me done dusted. I'll let you guys sell yourself now. Sell yourself, <laughs> Alex. Come on. I'm and Alex Burke. I'm that I'm that Norwegian guy. Um, and uh, yeah, you should subscribe to me if you want uh, monotonous, droning, Norwegian-accented English over semi-interesting Paradox Let's Plays. I do some other games sometimes, but lately I've been lazy. So um, yeah, I'm Alex Berg. You'll find me somewhere on the YouTubes. Link down below, I hope. You had me to subscribe, Alex. Oh yeah. I, I had you. True baby. love. <laughs> oh. Mm. Um, okay, um, I'm that one Not awkward guy, trouble. that one awkward guy, that amazing Canadian. My channel is mostly me riding polar bears and creating igloos. Yeah. The amazing Canadian. I love that. that I'm the amazing Canadian. Canadian. Oh, yeah. Yes. Tagline. Uh, <laughs> I'm, that's going to be a tag. I'm the amazing yes. Canadian. That needs to change your name <laughs> again. Happened. Yes, another rebrand. We're rebrand. We're rebranding again. In the, I literally did it less than a month ago. I'm not changing again. Uh, screw Northern Line. This is the amazing Canadian. <laughs> um, no. Um, I pretty much do a lot of Mountain Blade, Hearts of Iron, that kind of stuff. Um, if you're interested, check out my channel. Links in the description. And that's it. I'm not gonna sell out like you, Alex. Oh, oh, oh shots fired. Oh, I'm a sellout now. Okay. <laughs> Subscribe with benefits. Mm -hmm. Oh, with God. Benefits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, God. Well, okay. um, I guess that, that leaves me. Um, Who are you? I, that was who you are. I, I pretty much, you know, I, I play some of those as Hearts of Iron 4s, those Crusader King 2s. Um, I also play some actual action games, unlike everybody else, apparently. But, hey, know, Mountain okay. Blade it's is okay. action. There's fighting and shooting. <laughs> and I have revolvers. Well, that's an action game. Yeah, okay. Practically um, called. But anyway, that's, that's, not the important, that's not the important part. I do tutorials on how to mod. That's, that's, there you go. Yeah. But actually, Text no, I plan, on, I plan on doing more uh, tutorials. Uh, and actually, if you check out my perspective on this podcast, what I was doing the whole time, unlike everybody else, since they probably just had their Skype on the background. It's okay, I understand. Can't be as great as me. That's fine. It's all right. But, uh, Hey, jokes, guys. Jokes. I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go. I got really quiet. I got worried. I'm just gonna go. It's a joke. Bo anyway, block you. Real I, uh, quick. Yeah, I actually. This is. Uh, I developed the uh, thumbnail, as you can see, and you can watch the process. At least most of the process, as I was uh, working on it and making this great uh, thumbnail. That now that I think about it, none of you guys will be able to see until after it. But trust me, guys, it's great. I, I spent a lot of a lot of time on you this. Make it, whole you made it from scratch. Hour, hour and thirteen. What's it's that? The best like, thumbnail. entirely from scratch. Yeah. Wait, wait. Like, yeah, I did. Like, I don't know what you mean from scratch. Do you mean like, like I drew the art? Because no, yeah. I didn't draw the art. Oh, okay. No, he he stole the art from the internet, like exactly. everybody else. You think I can draw? <laughs> I thought you could draw. I thought I thought you were an artist. My life oh, is ruined. Uh, you seriously thought I was an artist? No. Okay, it's a six. <laughs> <laughs> Cringe. Okay, that's that. I think. Yeah. That wraps up our out. first oh, podcast. First... There we go. Well. Yeah, I guess this is a podcast. Yeah, best yeah, or room podcast. And we're, we're gonna do it again. again. We should, we yeah, we're gonna it do it again. Let us know, guys. Do you, um, if you're looking to have this thing like every other week, every week. We just want to get a sense of how much you guys 
Um, like it, so make sure to comment your opinions down below. Oh. Anything you'd like to see us change? Any other games you might want us to talk about? And we'll Better be sure to comment if you made it to the end. Yeah. If you, if comment if you made it to the end. Comment what we should talk about in future. Comment to say how much you love Alex. And mm -hmm. if we get 10,000 thumbs up, that's, that's optimistic. If we get 100 <laughs> thumbs up, um, then Alex will... Uh, no, nope. uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited to hear it. What will well, I that's do? That's a surprise. <laughs> when we get 100 likes, Alex will do something. Something. <laughs> yes. I, I will do something. Right, guys, I'm done. Something. Okay, yeah. hold on. Real quick. Uh, also, make sure we don't have more than four people, because otherwise my thumbnail is going to be broken, and it's going to be really hard to change and add another person to the thumbnail. <laughs> but you guys will see. You guys We're will not going to have more than four people. Good, I'm because otherwise... Grimmick is the king of thumbs. He has the greatest thumbs. The king of thumbs. The king of 